protocol to uh, escort His Excellency. The Assembly will now hear these, a statement by His Excellency Mr. Pedro Castillo Terrones, President of the Republic of Peru. I would ask protocol to escort His Excellency to the rostrum. On behalf of the General Assembly, I would like to welcome to the United Nations His Excellency Pedro Castillo Terrones, President of the Republic of Peru, and to invite him to address this assembly. Señor Presidente. President, please accept on behalf of the people of Peru my warmest congratulations on your election to preside over the General Assembly. Your wealth of diplomatic experience and your commitment to environmental issues will contribute, I am convinced of it, to the success of our work. Moreover, I wish to greet and thank the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, for his initiatives to promote a more efficient and fairer global governance. I also wish to thank him for his diligent work in a world, a turbulent world indeed, which calls for strong leadership. The international situation is complex, difficult and delicate. Strategic balances are shifting and our peoples are observing with worry and concern the disintegration of peace, the disintegration of the environment and the worsening of the international economic situation. The world is moving dangerously towards situations which will see clashes and interests pitted one against the other. These situations are creating grave tension at unprecedented historic levels. Peru reaffirms its staunch position of defending the principle of non-aggression and its position of respecting the territorial integrity of states. We reiterate that the Russian Federation's intervention in Ukraine is illegitimate. Moreover, we condemn the persistent occupation by Israel of Palestinian and Arab territories since 1967. Achieving peace rules out any selectivity in the application of the United Nations Charter. All armed interventions violate the Charter. There are not good and bad interventions. Moreover, all types of sanctions other than those adopted by the Security Council as part of its action to preserve peace and security are illegitimate and run counter to international law. Any other types of unilateral sanction are illegitimate and again run counter to international law. This includes economic sanctions. Once wars or aggressions have occurred, the duty of the international community is to work to ensure a ceasefire and the resolution of conflicts through peaceful means, and this through diplomatic negotiations. We must not provide incentives for conflict. We must make peace our mission. Consequently, Peru once again reiterates the need for a ceasefire to be agreed in Ukraine. We must see increased protection of civilian society affected by conflict and negotiations to find a peaceful solution must begin. This solution must take account of the interests of all parties. At the same time, it is crucial that we ensure the continuity of the agreement which allows the export of grain from Ukraine. And has in, as has been indicated by the Secretary General, arrangements must be made to normalize Russian exports of fertilizers, the absence of which is suffocating the poorest farmers of the developing world. It is vital to avoid a situation whereby economic sanctions affect food security. This is ultimately a problem which is inextricably linked to the respect of the human right to food. As far as the situation in Palestine is concerned, its territories have seen a spike in violence a few months ago. Here 
It is vital too that the international community shoulders once and for all its responsibilities and that it enables peace negotiations to ultimately find a solution based on the recognition of two states, an independent and viable Palestine and an Israel with secure borders. It is only thus that we will have a lasting peace. The government of Peru will soon open diplomatic representation in Palestine, a step fully in line with the principle of the universality of diplomatic relations. Mr. President, in a context of instability and the weakening of consensus, diplomatic consensuses and negotiations, in order to transform hotbeds of conflict into arenas where peace can be built, we must take a leap forward to ultimately strengthen and expand peacekeeping operations of the United Nations. On my government's instruction, Peru has practically doubled its military troops in six peacekeeping missions throughout the world. And we are particularly present in bringing peace and stability to the Central African Republic. We will also shortly in contribute police personnel to peacekeeping operations. Only a few days ago, I opened in Lima the first conference of Latin American and the Caribbean on peacekeeping operations, entitled Living in Peace. The conference has lent great momentum to increasing the participation of Latin America and the Caribbean in United Nations peacekeeping operations. And this step is grounded in the principles of the consent of the parties, impartiality and the non-use of force except in self-defence. Yet more important still, the Lima Conference has decided to create the Latin American and Caribbean Network for Cooperation in Peacekeeping Operations. Peru is committed to the immediate implementation and operationalization of the network. Latin America was decisive in the very creation of the United Nations. Grounded in the principles of solidarity and joint action, Latin America must as such increase its contribution to conflict resolution and peace. It is indeed its historic tradition. In this vein, my government will increase consultations to strengthen South America as a zone of international peace. However, peace is not only broken by way of armed action, as is stated in the, preamb the preambular part of UNESCO's constitution, since wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that the defences of peace must be constructed. We must build in the minds of men the values of peace, and that involves respecting others, protecting human rights, not exploiting the weakest among us, promoting dialogue, and promoting the peaceful resolution of conflict. But ensuring peace involves rooting out ideologies of hate. This is something that the United Nations systematically does with the ongoing support of Peru. Racism, intolerance, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, all of these must be rooted out. Peace involves an awareness of the common destiny of humankind. Acting with a sense of responsibility to build this common future involves respecting the principle of non-intervention and at the same time it involves showing solidarity towards the poor and the weak, towards the dispossessed, towards the vulnerable. Acting with responsibility to build this common future involves respecting human rights and fundamental freedoms as well as civil rights, political rights, economic rights, social rights and cultural rights. And moreover, the collective rights of peoples, the rights of indigenous persons. The state has a duty to guarantee 
individual freedom. However, guaranteeing the enjoyment of social rights essential for human dignity, such as the human right to education, the human right to health care, the human right to housing, the human right to water, the human right to food, to a decent wage, is also vital. And thanks to this General Assembly, we can and now must guarantee the human right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment. Building peace also involves fulfilling the mandate to resolve the as yet unresolved situation of colonial territories and peoples. Peru fought for its independence at the beginning of the 19th century, driven by the principle of the self-determinations of peoples. As such, since 1947, its diplomatic efforts have supported and continue to staunchly support the access to independence and self-determination of territories and peoples that are under the United Nations mandate to ultimately access their independence. Peru has restored diplomatic relations with the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic and firmly supports its right to self-determination. We extend our broadest support to nations, to rather to the endeavors that the Secretary General's representative must undertake to re-establish the ceasefire in the Western Sahara and the endeavors he will undertake to bring about a negotiated and peaceful solution. Bolstered by this same belief, Peru fully recognizes the rights of sovereignty of the Argentine Republic over the Malvinas Islands, and we call upon parties to begin, begin consultations and negotiations to give tangible form to this pressing goal and to ensure it is achieved. Mr. President, the international economic situation is becoming critical. The negative effects of the pandemic on productive processes and particularly on worsening living conditions of the poor and very poor majorities, as well as problems when it comes to regular regularizing supply chains, inflations and spikes in energy prices are producing a grave crisis of global proportions, which will only produce more poverty and more exclusion. Global growth indicators are not encouraging. On the contrary, global growth is showing a downward trend. Latin America is suffering the negative impacts of inflation, of a contraction in economic growth and of difficulties to restore the downward trend in poverty and extreme poverty that was seen before the pandemic. The region as a whole is displaying increasingly high rates of indebtedness, which are becoming increasingly unsustainable. To tackle these global and regional trends, which affects potential for growth, in Peru, we have adopted the plan Driving Economic Growth, Driving Peru. Our goal with this plan is to grow to the tune of 3.3%. Whatever the percentage achieved, we wish to grow beyond the Latin American average. We are convinced that our central goal is to create more employment and more quality employment and as a consequence we are fostering and improving conditions for national and foreign investment. We, get, we are giving pride of place in this plan to micro, small and medium sized businesses. Peru is a country with stable and positive macroeconomic variables. We have a functioning economy and one which welcomes private and public investment for the benefit of those most in need. The Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, proposed a new social contract at a global level. This new commitment must absolutely and inevitably linked, be linked to the development of and achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals which are being heavily jeopardized. 
we wish we need to reaffirm our political will to ensure that the United Nations development system give priority across all its agencies to fulfilling the targets of the Agenda 2030 in the most critical areas. Priorities must be as follows. One, halving the number of poor people. Two, eradicating extreme poverty. Three, making zero hunger a reality so that all families enjoy food security. Four, achieving efficient and universal health coverage for all. Five, ensuring that all girls and boys finish primary and secondary education. This secondary education must be free, equitable and of quality. Six, put an end to all forms of discrimination against women and girls throughout the world. Seven, achieving universal and equitable access to drinking water at an affordable price for all. And lastly, gradually achieving a situation whereby the income of the poorest 40% of the population is higher than the national average and ensuring it remains such. The new global compact must draw its strength and momentum from a renewed commitment, one which gives focus to our political will and ensures that we channel financial resources towards achieving the goals of Agenda 2030. Agenda 2030 is not only a programme for peace, justice and equality at a global level, rather it is an integral part of our national agendas. This year, climate change has meant that extreme heat and floods have reached their worst levels in history. Greenhouse gas levels continue to rise. These are the cries of Mother Earth. She is asking us not to continue assaulting nature. I issue an appeal, particularly to the industrialised nations, to find new momentum to halt global warming. As heads of state, we must be cognizant of the fact that our targets to ensure we meet targets of reducing new emissions already need to be seven times higher than they are if we are to achieve the ultimate goal of making sure that global warming is no greater than 1.5 degrees. The United Nations has once again expressed its support for environmental rights defenders and for the protection of their rights, their lives and their access uh, and indeed supported access to environmental information on the part of citizens and indigenous peoples. The Escazú Agreement, which Peru signed, reflects the awareness of the peoples of Latin America of the need to implement the historic decision of the General Assembly, a decision which recognised environmental rights as human rights. Escazú is an instrument to affirm our sovereignty over natural resources in the Amazon region. The oceans too require urgent agreements to preserve marine life and marine ecosystems as well as their bi biodiversity. Peru supports negotiations for a treaty which will regulate fishing activity and eliminate the pollution of seas beyond 200 nautical miles. We reiterate in unequivocal terms our sovereign control of our seas until 200 nautical miles as established in our constitution. Mr. President, Latin America has a tradition of democracy. At the same time, it has the highest levels of social inequality in the world, but the Latin American people continue to demonstrate historic strength as they seek fairer and more egalitarian societies, societies with greater social cohesion, where common where everyone has a right to a common home without exclusions. They are convinced of the righteousness of their cause. In Peru, we are moving along this path. Democracy involves the existence of opposed political positions. Therein lies freedom. 
However, democratic governance calls for the respect of institutions and it calls for the respect of the people's will. Coups, however they are conducted, or whoever the authority that drives them forward, are illegitimate. They undermine the sovereign expression of popular will. As is the case with external crises, all governance crises or crises which see clashes between branches of power must be resolved through dialogue, cooperation and the full respect of electoral outcomes. The Inter-American Democratic Charter, which is one of Peru's contributions to democracy in the Americas, establishes the aforementioned in unequivocal terms. In this world, in which we are increasingly moving towards conflict and in a world where we're seeing internal political crises, we need to remain cognizant of four pillars to defend democratic governance and that is so important. We need to bear in mind the respect for peoples, the desire to solve conflicts via negotiation, the respect for human rights and the institutional framework of the rule of law. I am the head of state of a multi-ethnic and multicultural country with more than 3,000 years of growth from the cradle of civilizations that have encountered difficulties to eliminate racism and social inequality. My government symbolizes the demands, aspirations and dreams of those that have had nothing or very little indeed, their aspirations to join national life as authors of their own destiny. Peru's agenda for social inclusion is that of the new social contract which the United Nations wishes to see for all peoples of the world. It is an agenda which prioritizes the principle of leaving no one behind. And we are prioritizing an inclusion which will achieve tangible form for the benefit of all, particularly for the poorest and most vulnerable among us. We wish to see a world for all. Many thanks indeed. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Republic of Peru for the statement just made, and I request the protocol to escort His Excellency.